So this morning's message is entitled, Who is the Little Man Girl? Who is the Little Man Girl? And I'm going to begin by referring you to the scripture that we looked at in a few moments, John 1, 14. Now, there is a quotation from Hans Christian Andersen who wrote many, many children's stories. And he says, the whole world is a series of miracles, but we're so used to them that we call them ordinary things. Here we are, living examples of miracles. The gift of life is a miracle, isn't it? And so I went over the story briefly with you, and you saw the vision. Now, I'm not expecting that it'll be my grandmother who'll come to get me, so don't be distracted with that. But did you notice the last scene? A little frozen body with a smile. A mystery to the passers-by. They don't understand it, but I think we do. I think we do. And you might ask yourself, who do you identify with? I hope not the cruel father who sent his poor little girl out, or the uncaring strangers, or the uh, puzzled passers-by. Anybody identify with the Christmas goose in the vision? The loving grandmother? Or the little match girl? We want to focus on the little match girl, because we see that it is Jesus who identifies with the little match girl. That's the scripture we read. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, God the Son, the word, became one of us and moved into our neighborhood. He moved into the little girl's neighborhood. He's moved into the neighborhood of those who are the most destitute, the most desperate. God with us, Emmanuel. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. So that's a little Hebrew lesson. Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel is with us. El, God. God with us. And we know that in this world there are some very desperate places, some very desperate experiences. We here have it pretty good, right? Uh, I brought uh, a uh, young lady that we are calling our Sudanese daughter, Karima. And uh, she's here. You want to stand up for a minute? You don't mind that. Stand up. Stand up. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Karima. Peace. And uh, so, uh, in just a couple of days ago, we were looking at uh, news reports of what's happening in Sudan. Food shortages, riots, and it's again because of the wickedness that we have that people bring. Why? Because they are not listening to the Prince of Peace, you see. But God is present with us even in our most desperate circumstances, and I suspect that many of you can say, Amen, I know that. I've been through deep waters, and God has been present. God with us, God moving into the most humble of our uh, experiences. We sing, away in a manger, no crib for a bed. We understand that this is a feeding trough for animals, right? Okay? And we're going to go home to beds a lot better than that. Now, some of you folk farm, and I don't think that any of you would want to choose to put your baby in a feeding trough for animals. I don't think that any of you would say, boy, I'm going to go and sleep in the barn today. It's going to be good. And yet, that's exactly what we see. Jesus who comes and moves into our experience, our life, breaking the very presence, the reality of God, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, 
taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Are these familiar scriptures? Yes. You know that Paul uses the scripture to teach us lessons in humility. Now, here is uh, the Bill Gates house. Anybody know the name Bill Gates? Oh, well, some of you know. Uh, is he a friend of yours? <laughs> Introduce me. <laughs> His house apparently costs 147 million to build. It has 66,000 square feet. Now, I understand that there are 16,000 square feet in this building. Is that right? All right, so that gives you an idea of the size of this man's house. He did not move into my neighborhood. <coughs> did he move into yours? And yet what we have is the king of glory who has moved into our neighborhood. The scripture we looked at even last week from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. For you know the grace, the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, unimaginable, far, far beyond anything that Bill Gates will ever possess. By the way, you know how much Bill Gates will leave behind? Everything. And so it's good that he's doing good things, but that may actually be a judgment on him because he now understands what's really important in life. I pray that God will turn his heart towards heaven. Yet for your sakes he became poor so that through his poverty you might become rich. You see, Jesus moved into my neighborhood. That means that whatever I'm experiencing, Jesus has been there. So was Jesus a refugee? Yes, Jesus was a refugee. Was he part of a persecuted minority? Yes, Jesus was part of a persecuted minority. And we can go on through the list of all the things that we recognize in this world as being less than just. And Jesus has experienced it all for our sakes. And when you think of the manner of his death, what a horrific death on a physical level. But even more consequential is to think the prayer that he prayed, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because you see, in that moment, infinity was happening. And he was experiencing something that he had never experienced before, which was a separation from his heavenly father. How unimaginable. Jesus moved into my neighborhood. My life. And so who is the little match girl? Well, it's also the poor and the needy. Because you see, Jesus identified with us. Jesus identified with the poor, and we also are to identify with the poor. Is that not true? And thank God for every manifestation that actually moves us on this journey to think about somebody other than myself. And you know the parable that the Lord Jesus told. And we have these beautiful words from Matthew chapter 25. And we read, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry. And you invited, and you fed me. Gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or need you clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these, Overlooked or in need, yet did for me. 
This is the identification that Jesus has with those in need. And so friends, even as we enjoy the richness of this, and let's do that, but let's invite others in, let's include others who need. And you might say, I don't think I could do much. Well, do what you can, right? That's what God wants you to do. Even if it's just a moment that you take to buy someone a cup of coffee or greet someone, make them feel welcome, do something, even a cup of water given in His name. You see, this is part of the Christmas message. So who is the little match girl? Those that need materially. And we have James chapter 1 that we know. And we read there the only place where you find the word religion. But religion means the worship of God that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. And look at this. To care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Thank God that God enlarges our hearts so that we reach out around the world. I think of the Shelters Project as one of the examples where we can see that. But that's not the only one. In my study, there are all kinds of bundles. Pastor Rob is responsible for that. Kind of. Yeah. You just, all the, the girls in the youth group who want to do something for the homeless and those in need. And he couldn't find enough places to stuff things, so go look. You'll see things stuffed in there. Praise God for that, right? That is wonderful. That's good. But that should only encourage us to do more as God gives us the opportunity. And don't, don't ever say, I can't do anything. You can do something. Who is the little match girl? Well, I am. We all are. Because we are all in need spiritually. You see in the scripture, Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, it's in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who know that they have nothing to give God in themselves. That we have a desperate need. And he says, to them belongs the kingdom of heaven. Praise God. Praise God. I come to Jesus and simply say, Lord, you know how much I need you and how little I have to offer. And yet I give you what I have. And you see, we're like the little match girl. We're busy striking the matches, trying to keep our lives going, trying to keep warm. And <clears throat> we go through life trying to make a go of it. And if this is all we have, how desperate it is. Because we won't be lying there with a smile on our faces. At the end of it all, we'll say, is that all there is? And so one of the beautiful things that we know is when somebody who in desperation says, is this all there is, finally comes to the realization of what happens when they give your life to Jesus. We had a team challenge up here a few weeks ago. And we heard story after story after story of how God changed and transformed their lives. In fact, if we were to simply take the opportunity, we would hear many of those same stories coming from us all, right? That we have experienced. I was a 13-year-old boy who discovered Jesus and discovered that I should have had it all together. Do teens have it all together, guys? Any teens here? Got any questions? Got any thoughts? Got any doubts? Well, let me tell you, you'll find it in Jesus when you are honest about your own spiritual poverty, when you come to God in all simplicity. And you see, here is a reality that we see reflected in the biblical values that uh, are behind this little match girl story. It's that the little girl is a soul with a body. An eternal being with a body. Not a body with a soul, maybe. We are living in a time when we are told repeatedly, 
There is no soul. There is no spirit. Everything that's here, that's material, is all that there is. Well, let me tell you this story without an awareness of the reality of the spiritual is simply a story without hope. A body without a soul has no hope. The Lord Jesus reminds us, do not fear them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body together in heaven. Making us aware that we are all going to be accountable one day to meet our God. And he asked this question, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Your soul is too precious to simply trade it in for what you can get in this life. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? We are spiritual beings being prepared for eternity. And we sing about this in our Christmas carols. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask you to stay close by me forever. And love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in your tender care. And fit us for heaven. So while you're enjoying your Christmas turkey, don't get stuck there. What happens if you get, if you get too full of turkey? I want to ask. And fit us for heaven to live with you there. And I'm glad that for each one who during Christmas season begins to reflect once again on these eternal realities, but there's so much more than simply what you can get if you're a Christmas Christian. Now, <clears throat> I've introduced you to a member of our family who's here today. Then I'm going to introduce you to another uh, member of my family, my grand grandson, William. You see them there? And I brought one of William's toys today. Now, he doesn't know I have it. So I'll have to make sure I get it back before he's aware that his front end loader, Callet Caterpillar Yellow and all, is gone. But I thought I would bring this because you see, one of the things that we deal with in our uh, Western culture is this thing called Darwinism, right? And we are, it's simply infiltrated every place, every place. And so this is not going to be a really long presentation on this, but I want you to reflect. Because you see, this is one of the issues about why we do not think about God and about eternity is because we have repeated to us over and over again that this world is all that there is. And yet, the reality increasingly is that there is an intelligent design. And if there's an intelligent design, there is a designer. So, Adam, I understand that you're a mechanic, right? So, in Darwin's day, you see, he had this really, really primitive understanding of a cell. And he thought it was just a blob, a really simple thing. And he also thought, believe this or not, that there was spontaneous generation. In other words, life could spring out of dirt all on its own. Now, I think most of us are smarter than that, right? And you see, he didn't know about microbes. There's Louis Pasteur who actually uh, gave us the light on microbes and so on. So, Adam, if we were to lock this in a, your garage, okay, and leave it there a year, what we, would we see a full-blown operational front-end loader a year from now? No. Ten years from now? No. A million years from now? No. Ten million. A hundred million. A billion. Absolutely not. Well, understand that uh, that's the kind of silly thinking that passes off for science. 
Okay? My phone. My phone. I have a pretty good phone. Well, I think I do. Anyway. I did, did some of you take? No, I haven't. I understand somebody lost their phone for a while. But here's my phone. And we think that this is a nice, complex piece of uh, electronic machinery, don't we? I want to tell you that a single bacterium, a single cell creature is much, much more complex than this is. That's what biochemistry has discovered. That it has all kinds of uh, incredible design and interlocking pieces. You miss a single piece, what happens? Nothing. It doesn't work. It has to work all the time from the first time. Have you ever thought about how uh, your blood clots? Okay? Now, if your blood clotted all the time, what would happen to us? We would die because we just would be just one big blood clot. And yet somehow, your blood somehow knows how to turn itself off and on at exactly the right time when it cuts. And it turns out that it is a very complex series of biochemical processes that must happen. How does that happen? It has to work right the first time. Praise God that it does. Oh, that will fix it, don't worry. Okay. Now, the reality is that Darwinism is dead, has always been dead, and now there are more and more scientists who are beginning to be willing to speak up, but because of intimidation, because of bullying, they have not been speaking up. So all I am doing right now is just giving you a little taste of what the reality is. Most of us have uh, plenty enough common sense that we know that if we find a phone on the sidewalk, we don't say, oh, well, look what time and chance has created. We say, somebody has lost, right? And so let's understand that the kinds of prejudices, the superstition that's out there should not affect our ability to think about this reality, that we are souls with bodies. And there is no other explanation that makes sense apart from the reality that God has created us for his glory. What is the little match girl story without having soul? It is a sad, sad thing. It is cruel to ignore those in need materially, we know that. It is even more cruel to give no hope for eternity. And there are millions, millions who will never have enough in this life. And there are millions who have more than enough in this life and are still without hope. And that is why at Christmas time, indeed, every time we look in the scriptures and we look towards our God, we say there is more than this life. There is something worth living for. And so Jesus, when he met with Mary and Martha after the death of Lazarus, put a poignant question to her. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. Doesn't that bring you hope? And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Friends, when this old carcass, when this old carcass is done and gone, I will still be alive. How about you? Yeah. And it will be better. It will be better. And Jesus asked the question then of Mary and Martha, and he asked it of us now. Do you believe this? And that's what will give you joy in Christmas. Who is the little match girl? We all are. You and I will die physically just like the little match girl. But you and I are immortal souls with a body, yes. But we will live forever. And so if we're going to make sense of our living, then we center on Jesus. We center on eternity. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who know that they are empty without Jesus, for they will experience the power, the presence, the blessing, and the authority of God in their lives by receiving him. 
What a beautiful thing. There's a God-shaped space in each of us that only God can fill. And when that is filled, it's amazing how everything begins to make sense and everything begins to work together. And it's not that our troubles are over. They are. But we go through this life with hope, with confidence, with the presence of God, and so often with the incredible answers to prayer. So, yes, for some we are reminded that Christmas is hard. It could be hard for me. It could be hard for any of us. And I'm not minimizing where you are in your journey. Understand that. But if we focus on ourselves, we are lost. We are sad. No more. And what Christmas really wants us to do is to focus higher. Born to us is what? Christ, the King, there is something, there's someone who can never be taken away from us. And so let's make Christmas about living like Jesus, for Jesus, and in the power of His Spirit. Identify with Jesus right now. You can decide to do that right now. And instead of waiting for someone to bless you, you bless someone. We gave praise and uh, appreciation to Kobe. Well, let me tell you, in the short time that I've been here, I've learned that Kobe exemplifies so much about blessing others. Be active in seeking to bring the blessing of Jesus to others. And guess what happens? Jared, what happens? You can talk. It's okay. I, I, I met Jared just uh, about a month and a half ago and began a conversation and God's been, been opening in him this capacity to bless others in a way that brings encouragement to him and so much good to others. You don't have to say more, but I've singled you out, okay? So when he stands up, he's taller than most of us, you might notice him. But we have a promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so he joins us where we are, and we join him where he is. And we have the promise that he has made a provision for us. And someday, yes, we will be caught up and go where there is no more sorrow, no more tears, and no more death. So as we conclude this morning, friends, remember Christmas is about centering ourselves, our lives on him right now. And let's make it really practical. I've introduced you to the way of Jesus saves. I am being sent by Jesus to do what? Bless others. And invite them to follow Him. I'm learning to be like Jesus in my attitudes, behaviors, and character. And I'm learning to love God by obeying Him and to love others by serving them. Overcome evil with good, right? And so when somebody does you dirt or somebody hurts your feelings, what do you do? You do the tit for tat. Right now we're, we're, we're seeing this on the international level. China and the U.S. back and forth. And we're caught in the middle right now. Don't you wish that our political leaders could get past this kind of childish playground? tit for tat. And don't you think that we as God's people of all people should be exemplifying getting, getting past that? Yeah. So feeling hurt is a choice, friends. And choosing the good is the better choice. And we're going to stop. We're going to stop. Because my time is getting close to being done and you want to go home and enjoy your turkey? No? No? But when you do, remember, take Jesus with you. Because Jesus walks with us. When times are good, when times are tough, and when time is over, Jesus, beginning and end, and everything else. God bless you. Let's pray together. And I'll invite those who uh, minister in prayer at the end of service to come if you'd like to come for additional prayer. Uh, we're going to sing a song and then 
then if you'll come. I'm going to pray right now. Lord Jesus, as we have spent a little time together, we've enjoyed worshiping you. And one of the songs we sing sometimes at Christmas time is, O Holy Child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas carols, the great black night is dealt. Oh, come to us. Abide with us. Our Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have come and that you've moved into our neighborhood. And we are confirming our choice. That we want you, O oh Lord, in our lives. In the very center, in the very heart of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. Make us attentive to your voice by your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name. Now, God's people say, Amen. Amen.